When we were at GCSE, we learnt that transition metals were the elements in the periodic table that were down here. These were the elements. And they always struck me as kind of a, a weird and confusing part of chemistry, because they couldn't be put into these groups like we can put the halides and the noble gases, and they don't really have a strict set of rules. It's not like carbon where we can reliably say that it always is going to form these four bonds because it's a, because of its four valence electrons. I mean, iron can form uh, two plus ions by donating two electrons, or three plus ions by donating three. It's not like they they all do the same thing all the time, and that's why they were always really confusing to me. But now at A-level, we get to learn why a lot, of, a lot of the time that these rules apply. Not like we did in GCSE, where we're just left to wonder and be confused. But why are they called transition metals? That's what I never got. I just guessed that it was because that they transitioned from this part to this part of the periodic table. And in a way, I was kind of right. But let's look at it a bit deeper. The, the term was first used back in, I think it was like 1732 or somewhere around that time, quite a long time ago, back when they thought that electron shells were kind of the right theory about atoms. And if you remember, electron shells can be filled in the uh, level 2, and then we can have 8 electrons in the next shell, and then 18, and then 32, and 18 again, and so on, until we get back down to 2. And... When we're looking at this row here, we we see there's we fill one row with the two, and then we fill another, then we fill the second one in that shell. But then we go back down to the previous shell and start filling it up from eight to eighteen. And there's a cool picture of this that I'll probably link in the description that shows it better than I could ever illustrate. And if you follow it along, you see that you end up with two in the outer shell here, and then you go back down and go from 8 to 18 over here. And this 8 and this 18 are quite stable. And that's why they're called transition metals, because you're transitioning from the stable configurations of 8 to the stable configuration of 18, with a very unstable configuration in between. But now these electron shells we can think of in terms of orbitals, with our current theory of electron orbitals. And we know that the 4s electron electron orbital fills up before the 3d one and that's what's happening in that shell theory we see the two 4s orbitals fill up no we should we show the two electrons in the 4s orbital fill up before the 3d and we can illustrate that with the electron configurations that i've drawn up before because they take a lot of effort and a lot of time and in a level we define transition metals in a very specific way. We say that a transition metal is an element that can form at least one common ion, so usually use it, losing electrons for these metals, where the d orbital is incomplete. So if we look at what we thought were transition metals in GCSE, using this definition we get something quite different. If we look at scandium, when we form an ion, we lose three electrons. So we go from having this 3d1, 4s2, to just having the electron configuration of argon. And using the definition of having an incomplete d orbital when we form an ion, this is not a transition metal. So we can cross scandium off. And if we look at zinc, when we form an ion there, we form a 2 plus ion. And then our configuration there has a 3d10 configuration. And this isn't an incomplete d orbital, because this is full. So this isn't a transition metal either, so we can cross zinc off. So instead of having this configuration, now we look at these as transition metals, and we only look at the first row in A-levels, so we'll be concentrating on these. And if that's kind of weird, then yes it is. Transition metals kind of change depending on who 
you go for for the definition. I mean, the uh, proper strictest of the strict definition by the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry so it takes into account both of those things while still having the incomplete d orbital. They can say it's either on its own got an incomplete d orbital or it forms an ion. So in that definition, scandium still is a, a transition metal, so we look at these things here. But we're not going to look at those, we're just going to look at the A-level definition, which says that you need to form a common ion, at least one, that has an incomplete d orbital. So now that we can think of these in terms of these orbitals, we start seeing pretty cool properties come about. So the first of those properties is that we can have a variable oxidation state. And we get those because the 4s orbital and the 3d orbital are very close together and similar in energies, so we can lose electrons from both of them pretty easily. I mean, that's why iron, for example, can form a 2 plus and a 3 plus. It can either lose its 4s electrons to get a Fe uh, 2 plus equals Ar uh, 3d6, or it can form a 3 plus ion to get. 3d5. And that brings kind of another point. I mean, you should have seen this break in the pattern going uh, down the electron configurations that you should remember from, I think it's unit one, where uh, this configuration is a lot more stable because both of your orbitals are half full or one of them is completely full and the other is half full, as opposed to just having kind of a weird in-between balance. So that, that's just something you should remember there. And that also applies to these ions. It's a lot more efficient to either have um, one of them f half full or one of them full. But they can definitely form these different ions, and that's why, as I said earlier, they're kind of weird. You don't get a strict set of rules. But because of these variable oxidation states, they can take part in a lot of different redox reactions. They can give and take electrons from a lot of different things, and that makes them very good for catalytic activity. So they also show catalytic activity. Catalytic activity. I'm not the best speller, but that's right. Okay. So they show these catalytic activities, and you go on to study a lot about the catalytic properties of transition metals. They also form complexes, and we'll go and talk a lot more about that in another video. But that basically means that other things can donate electrons to it and form uh, pretty pretty cool little shapes around it. Why did I just delete that? Pretty cool uh, shapes where you get uh, different, what well, they're called, ligands attached to these transition metals. And we can also, because of these complexes, we also show colours. A lot of these different ions show a lot of different colours, and if you saw a change in the tone of my voice, that's because everything you will ever hate about chemistry comes from this. In Unit 5, for whatever reason, they decided it was a good idea to make you memorise a bunch of different colours. They don't make you learn why they are the colours they are, they just make you learn the fact that they're different colours and you can memorise all of the colours and there's tons of them. I think there's more like 32 or something like that that you have to memorise and it is the worst part of chemistry. There is no need for it, but they make you do it anyway. But they do make you learn why they are coloured and that is quite a cool thing. I find that quite a cool little part of chemistry slash physics that kind of sits on the border of both. So let's let's look at why they're coloured. Well you know that light is composed of the visible electromagnetic radiation spectrum and that's different wavelengths of energy that range from I think it's 380 nanometers in the blue light spectrum all the way to 
uh, 760 nanometers in the red spectrum. So that that's where our rainbow comes from. We have these different wavelengths of light being refracted. And you know that white light composes of all of these. You get a combination all the way from 380 to, three, to 760, and all of that comes together to form white light. And you should also know that when things are coloured, that's them absorbing some wavelengths and letting others reflect or pass through them. And that is the main reason why transition metal complexes are coloured. And it's a really cool little thing because it takes into account something known as electron transi electronic transitions. And that occurs because of the incomplete d orbitals. Now, when, electron, when electromagnetic radiation in the form of light hits an electron, let's draw the electron, the electron moves between states. An electron is usually at a ground state, and it absorbs this energy and moves to an excited state. Excited. An excited state. An excited state. And, of course, what goes up must come down, so it loses that energy again and moves back down to a ground state. And upon doing that, the energy has to go somewhere, so it is released as electromagnetic energy. Light. And that is what we call an electronic transition, the movement from one energy level to another. Now, the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation absorbed, so the colour of light, and the one emitted depends upon different of it depends on the difference between this ground level and this excited level now this can change this this difference in level and that's a number of different factors but you could have a level up here where the difference is like that and there is a german physicist called max planck and there is an equation named after him that shows a relationship between this difference in energy and the frequency of light that it absorbs and emits. And it is written like this. It says, delta E, the difference in energy, so this is delta E, is equal to Planck's constant, which uh, I think is equal to 6.2 no, 6.626 6 times 10 to the power of minus 34 joules. Now, you don't need to remember that, really. It's You just need to know that this is Planck's constant. And it is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of electromagnetic radiation. Why did I say that so weird? The frequency of electromagnetic radiation. And that is measured in Hertz, HZ. So that shows the relationship between the energy and the wavelength of light. And there's kind of a, a neat little thing here. It shows that the, that the energy is directly proportional to the frequency of light. So as this increases, well, as this increases, this is going to increase as well. And seeing as the wavelength of light is inversely proportional to the frequency of it, so as uh, the wavelength, I don't, I don't do physics, so I don't know what the symbol for wavelength, but as the wavelength is equal to like 1 over the frequency, it's, I don't think that's the exact equation, but seeing as when this increases, this is going to decrease, when we have these small energy transitions that involve a low frequency of light, the longer wavelength of radiation in the red part of the spectrum is going to be absorbed. And that's kind of what affects the colour of an ion. But where do these electrons move to and from? I mean, they don't move in between orbitals, that would be kind of, kind of weird. But this is kind of a mind-blowing little thing. 
we know our d orbital has five orbitals in it, and each of these can be filled with two electrons. But when a transition metal is attached to different ligands, which are those uh, things that attach to it in a complex, this d orbital, so this is uh, the 3d, splits up into two different energy levels. We have these two here, so these two move into two orbitals, and we get the bottom three as these three orbitals, and these can still fill with electrons. And this is why the incomplete d orbital thing is such a huge deal. When we have partially filled d orbitals, like this, electrons can move from this bit to this bit, and this difference in energy is what we saw happen here when the electromagnetic radiation hit it. And in order for this to happen, there needs to be electrons in here and space in here, and that is why you need an incomplete d orbital. You need electrons in the first place and space to move it to, and that is why they are that specific way in transition metals. And of course there are a bunch of different factors that affect this difference in energy, but we'll go on to do more about that when we do more about uh, transition metal complexes and the colours of them, which I am not looking forward to because I hate that part. But thanks for watching this short introduction, if you have any questions let me know, this is kind of a broad complex topic, but I will see you next time.